We're going to turn together, please, to Acts chapter 16, and we're going to read a few verses. It's lovely to be here and to share God's Word this evening. And we trust that God will help us and that, that we'll hear His voice, sense His presence. And if you tonight don't know the Lord yet as your Savior, that the Lord will speak to you and that you'll come to know Him as your personal Savior. I want to read a few verses in Acts chapter 16. And we're breaking into the story of the great apostle Paul and Silas who have been preaching the gospel and as a result they've ended up in prison. And when they get into prison they begin to pray that God will intervene and of course he does in a wonderful way. So we're breaking in there from verse 25 of Acts chapter 16. And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and every one's bands was loosed. And the keeper of the prison awaking out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors opened, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before them, before Paul and Silas, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Amen. And God will bless the reading of his word. Let's unite in prayer together, please. Our Father, we thank you that we can come in this simple fashion this evening, Lord, around thy word. And we thank you for the words that we have heard sung. We thank you, Lord, for the truths that have been presented to us. And Father, now as we bring your word, we ask for the gracious anointing of the Holy Spirit. We pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts as you opened the heart of Lydia, that we would hear your voice. And Father, I pray for every need, every person here tonight, and I ask the Lord that you would draw near. So Lord, afresh, I realize my own helplessness, and I give myself unreservedly to you, Lord. I claim your cleansing and sanctifying power on my spirit, soul, and body. And Lord, for the glory of the Lord Jesus and for the extension of your kingdom, I now take that promised Holy Ghost, the blessed power of Pentecost, to fill me to the uttermost, I take, and I thank you that he, the Holy Spirit, will undertake in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I'm sure on the journey of life, you realize that many things happen that are unpredictable and one only has to read a newspaper or listen to the news to discover that tragedies and unexpected happenings occur on a daily basis. And while we all want to keep such trials and tragedies away from us, it is inevitable that trials will come to our lives. The Lord spoke of that when he talked about two men who built their houses, one on sand and the other on rock. And the Lord said that they had built their houses and they looked good from a distance, but one had a good foundation, the other had no foundation. And the storm came, the great storm. And the storms of life are many and varied, but, but the greatest storm of all is the storm of death that comes and will come to each one of us, for the Bible says it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. And so everyone here tonight, you and I have an appointment with death. And what we're going to speak about uh, this evening is regarding that appointment. What I want to ask you, as any faithful gospel preacher would ask, is have you made preparation for that event? When that appointment is, have you made preparation so that if you were summoned by God to leave your body and to go into God's eternity, are you ready for that event? 
It is so important. And in order to get the answer and to understand what's required to be ready, you have to be willing to ask a question that these men asked. It's what I would describe as life's most important question. Life's most important question. When this man had been taken by the Lord and shaken, he had been previously an uncouth man. He was probably uneducated. He was uninterested. He was unmoved by the grief and the sorrow and the suffering of the preachers. He was a, a, a callous man. But the Lord shook him, and he was ready to commit suicide. But the Lord wonderfully intervened for him and not only saved his life, but saved his soul. And the question that this man asked when the Lord got a hold of him was this, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? I wonder, have you ever asked that question? <coughs> wonder, have you ever taken time to consider that, not for someone else, but for yourself? What must I do to be saved? I remember many years ago in a gospel mission that was held not far from here when I was converted, and I can remember the late Sam Workman preaching at that campaign. And these truths, these questions were being raised night after night. And there came a point whenever I no longer, in a sense, just viewed the congregation or listened to the preacher, but there came a point in that mission when I began to ask myself as a 17-year-old, what must I do to be saved? And you see, nobody has ever become a Christian that hasn't first of all considered it. You don't just go to sleep a non-Christian and waken up a Christian. That, that doesn't happen. You have to consider. Consideration is the commencement of conversion. Well, I'm going to be as practical and simple as I can this evening for you, because so often when it comes to the truths of knowing the Lord and of knowing our sins forgiven, so many people can be very well educated regarding religion and church and format and tradition. But yet if you were to say to them, do you know how to get right with God, they would be genuinely at a loss. They wouldn't know. They would know all about other things, but not about how to know God. And so in, I trust in a very simple manner, I'm going to try and explain to you from God's Word how you can know God's salvation, how you can be sure that you would be in heaven when your life would come to an end. I trust that you agree with me that that's the most important consideration in your life. I'm over 30 years a Christian now, and I've still yet to find a question being raised that is remotely as important as the question was raised when I was 17, what must I do to be saved? Well, this matter of salvation, the saving of our soul, is in the hands of the Lord. You see, dear friends, each of us have a soul. And the Lord said when he was on earth, he said, What shall it profit a man or woman if they gain the whole world and lose their own soul? I want you to notice that Jesus said that you have a soul. It wasn't the church that said it, Jesus said it. And Jesus said not only you had a soul, he said it was very valuable. He said, What would it profit you if you gained the whole world in comparison? And the other thing that many people often don't recognize is not only did Jesus say you had a soul, and Jesus said it was valuable, but Jesus said you could lose it. Jesus said you could lose it. What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? You see, there's only one thing I possess as I stand here tonight. I have a wife, I have a family, I have a home, I have a car, I have a few items like that, but I don't own them. I don't own them. Because one way or the other, they're going to part from me. 
Either I'll be taken from them or they'll be taken from me. So this whole notion about what I own and what that, that's out the window. That's you're only given that for a little time and God will then hold you accountable for what you did with it. But what you do own, you really own, is your soul. You see, there's a part of me, the real me, that lives inside my body. That part is going to live as long as God. And dear friends, every one of you here, from the youngest child to the oldest adult, you're going to live as long as God. And so when it comes to meeting him, wouldn't it be wise to say that what I would really need to be sure that, that this was right. I remember a lady who was quite ill, and uh, she had gone along to church and meetings, and she had made a profession when she was young, but, but I remember uh, talking to her not long before she died, and she knew she was dying, and she had cancer. And, and this lady, I went in with another minister. We just happened to coincide visiting her. And when we went in, she said, well, I remember trusting the Lord, and, and, and I followed him for a while, but I got away from him, and, and I wasted a lot of years, and so on and so forth. And she said, but you know, I, I want to be sure that when I die that I'm ready. I want to be sure. And she had no sense of uh, embarrassment about talking about the issue. She didn't have any hang-ups about talking about the things of God because that woman knew that in a short time that she was going to leave everything that she possessed and even her family. She was going to leave them all and go out. And she knew that she needed God. And my dear friends, we need God. We need the mercy of God in our lives, all of us. You say, well, why would I need God's mercy? Because you and I are sinners. Because you and I have broken God's law. You say, well, I haven't done anything. I didn't murder anybody. I didn't steal. I didn't. And maybe that's in your mind tonight. Maybe you say, well, I'm not that kind of a, I'm not that kind of a sinner. Well, Jesus said, he said, the heart of man is deceitful. He talked about it. He said, from within proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, murders, thefts. Jesus said there was nothing good about man. Jesus said that through his word in, in the book of Romans, he said, all have sinned and come far short of the glory of God. He said, well, I'm not a sinner. Well, then you're not going to die. I have good news for you. If you're not a sinner, you're not going to die. Don't bother getting a headstone or seeing the undertaker or buying a plot. You'll not need it. Because if you're not a sinner, you won't die. But guess what? Everybody dies. It doesn't matter whether you're a Protestant or a Catholic or an atheist or a Muslim or a Jew or whatever. It doesn't matter. You see, Jesus said, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And for that reason, we're going to die. And so you and I have that appointment, whether young or old. Now, in order to get our sins forgiven and be brought into a right relationship with God, the Holy Spirit commences the work of salvation in us by doing something very remarkable and wonderful and supernatural. It's what we call conviction. It's conviction of sin. And this is the work of the Holy Spirit. The preacher can't do it, although he becomes often the tool that God uses, but, but he can't do it. No preacher can do it. No man can do it. It's only the Holy Spirit can do it. And the Bible says it's done in such a unique way because Jesus said when he does do it, he's like the wind. And you know, when the wind blows, you feel it, but, but you can't put your hand on it. There's something mysterious about the wind. But you see the effects of it. And the Lord Jesus said that's what it's like when a person becomes a Christian. He said the wind of the Holy Spirit comes upon them and, and he speaks to them. And they become aware of it. And he said there's changes happen. So the Holy Spirit comes and the Bible tells us when he comes, he does specific things. There are unique things that the Holy Spirit does in the life of a person when he comes to them. It says when, when he, the Holy Spirit, has come, he will convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Those three things are the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He convicts us of our sinfulness. God will never come to us and tell us that we're wonderful. 
God will never come to us and say that, you know, he's so impressed with us. Now, what he will do is he'll come and convey to us his great love for us, but he will also demonstrate very clearly to us that we are not rightly related to him and that we are sinners. Now, for those who have experienced the new birth, you will identify and understand perfectly what it's like to go through this experience, because every person that is a true Christian and will be in heaven have all experienced conviction of sin. And it's not pleasant, because essentially what God does is God puts a mirror in front of you, and God permits you to see yourself as you really are in His sight. And God is holy. God can't look on sin. God can't conceal sin. He can't cover sin. In fact, the Bible says, whatsoever maketh a lie or whoever tells a lie, God says, it can't ever be in my presence. So sin bars us. And God loves us, so what he did was he sent his son, the Lord Jesus, who came, died on the cross, he rose again, and then he sent the Holy Spirit to do this work of conviction. Now, can you tell when a person is under conviction? Can you tell when God is dealing with a person? And the answer categorically is yes. Of course you can. Can you tell if God is not speaking to a person? Yes, there are many evidences often when, a, when God is not speaking to a person. What are the evidences? Well, the first one I want to draw your attention to is found in the life of Nicodemus. You see, Nicodemus in John 3 was a very religious man. Now, he was an equivalent of an archbishop or, you know, somebody high up. He could have quoted the first five books of the Bible without any problem. Nicodemus was a very educated and religious man. He was the man that everybody looked up to in order to find God, but he himself didn't know God. And so Nicodemus like all his colleagues, should have been very happy in his religious paraphernalia and position. But the Bible tells us that one night that there was this religious man in the dark of night running from one house to the next, hiding in the shadows, looking round in case anybody would see him and running to the next house because this religious leader was in pursuit of a man called Jesus. Now, why was this man doing this bizarre thing in the midst of the night, running to find Jesus? Because there was a great sense of need had fallen on Nicodemus. Nicodemus recognized that, that although he was religious, and although he would have been what we would call good living, he wouldn't have done you any harm, but he recognized in his own heart, I'm not right with God. Do you know the founder of the Methodists, John Wesley? John Wesley made off to Georgia as a missionary, an Anglican missionary. And when he went out to Georgia in America, he went out to convert the Indians. And do you know what he wrote in his journal on the way home? He said, I went out to convert the Indians or the Americans, but he said, alas, who will convert me? John Wesley himself was a minister and he wasn't converted. It was on a storm on the way home in the boat that there were some of the Moravians who knew the Lord as he watched them in the storm. They were unafraid of, of the boat going down. He couldn't understand how these people had such peace in the storm. And it was the beginnings of John Wesley coming to know Christ and then becoming the great fiery evangelist that went over Ireland and England and America to preach the Word of God. A great sense of need. You see, friends, when the Holy Spirit comes, he lets you recognize and see that religion is inadequate. It's inadequate. 
For the Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah, chapter 64 and verse 6, it says, all our righteousnesses, that's all our good works, are filthy rags in God's sight. Now, you wouldn't want to stand before the Lord with all these old dirty rags on you, would you, at the judgment? No, you would want clean clean clothing. And that clean clothing that you need at the judgment bar of God is what the Bible calls the righteousness of Christ. It's the garment of his salvation that he gives freely to all who come to him. That's the garment that you need. I wouldn't want to be meeting God with all my religion and good works wrapped around me because they're filthy rags in God's sight. There's a great sense of need. Not only that, there is a great unworthiness when a person is under conviction of sin. A great unworthiness. You see, there was a publican in the Gospel of Luke. And this publican came into God's house, and there was a religious man at the front. He wouldn't have been a converted man. He was a religious man. And Jesus told the story, and he said, the religious man stood at the front of the church or the house of God, and he said, Lord, I thank you that I give tithes of all I possess, and I'm good at this and good at that, and I do nobody any harm. And what a list of goodness he had for the throne. And he told God just how good he was. And he said, Lord, I'm not like this boy. And he pointed out this publican at the back of God's house. He said, I I wouldn't be like him. And Jesus said the publican at the back, he said he wouldn't even lift up his head. But he smote his breast and he said, God be merciful to me, the sinner. And Jesus said that the religious man went out unforgiven, but the publican went out forgiven. You see, friends, that helps us to recognize how we get into the kingdom of God. Certainly anybody that is telling God about what they've done and how good they've been and so on and so forth, there's not a hope of them ever getting to heaven. Not a hope. Imagine if you died as a good living person and you were full of good works, and you say, well, I've helped in this, and I've given to that, and I've sacrificed for that, and I do nobody, and you had this big list of things, how good you were. Imagine if you died and got to heaven. It wouldn't happen, but imagine if it did. And the Lord said, well, I, I just let you in. I shouldn't, but I'm going to let you in. So you would, you would stride down heaven's streets and walk through the great city, And there on the throne, the Lord Jesus and and all the saints, millions and millions of saints that have come to the Lord down through the centuries, all gathered around him and worshiping him. And you would come and say, what's going on here? Well, they're worshiping the Lord Jesus. Why are they worshiping Jesus? Well, because Jesus died for them on the cross and they've trusted trusted him and and he saved their soul and he forgave their sin and and they're just coming to, to thank him and to worship him because they couldn't have been here without him and they're just so grateful. You would turn around and say, well, hold on, I, I think I would need to go and see God the Father. And so you go on down and the Father and you say, uh, excuse me, I just want to we chat with you. Um, you see this, all these people here, all gathered around Jesus? Um, just want you to know that, that uh, I didn't need that. I didn't need him. Uh, I mean, I, I went to church. I, I did nobody any harm. I was ordained. I was whatever circumcised or catechized or whatever eyes you want. You say, I, I got everything that the, my religion could give to me. And so, so I, you know, really, do you see this sending Jesus? Now, this was all a waste of time because I got here on my own. Can you see how ridiculous it is? Not a hope of you getting. Only the people who get by the blood of the Lamb will be there. Only those who have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ who are able to say the Lord is my shepherd. Who are able to say that he has become my savior. Could you say that? You heard about the little boy. He was out. He had been taught. He had been taught by his mother. That lovely hymn, the Lord is my shepherd, I'll not want. And he used to get a little bit afraid. And so she'd say, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. And he was out one evening to 
find the sheep, and a storm came. And they looked for him, and they couldn't find him. And eventually, after several days of searching for the little boy, they, they found him. He had died in a snowdrift, and his little hand was holding on to that finger. The Lord is my, he's my shepherd. Is he your shepherd tonight? You see, friends, when a person is under conviction, there's a great sense of need. There's a great sense of unworthiness. And there's a great fear of hell and condemnation. The psalmist said these words. He says, The sorrows of death compassed me, and the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. I remember a lady telling us when I was in Bible college many years ago, she came and told us the story of how she got converted in the Lewis Revival way back in the 1940s and early 50s. And she said, as I sat in the meetings, as the presence of God, the Spirit of God would just settle down over the community and, and over the churches where, where God was working, she said, I, I could feel the flames of hell lick round my soul. She said, I, I could sense how near I was to hell. See, friends, you, you can't create that. that. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. A great fear of hell and condemnation. Now, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. He alone can do this. But it needs to be our prayer as Christians. We need to be praying, Lord, please send conviction. Whether it's our children, you know, uh, those of us who bring up our children and maybe, maybe they haven't the desire spiritually that we'd want them to have. Well, you can't coerce them to church and say, well, you're going to do this to try and force salvation into them. You can't do that. Now, you need wisdom with them. But ultimately, they need to meet with God. They need to meet with God. God must meet them as he met us. I sometimes say to my wife regarding our children, and I, I say, you know, if there's, if there's a lack of desire there, you know, we can do a whole lot for them. We can pray, we can, but they have to meet God the way we met him, ourselves. Salvation can't be passed on. God has no grandchildren. You must come yourself to him, to know him. Con conviction is the work of the Spirit. Then there's contrition. Contrition. You see, it's how we respond to the work of the Spirit. There are times when the Holy Spirit draws near in the lives of individuals. And as I said, it's like the wind. There's a mystery about it. As God comes, now sometimes he comes to a community, and the Holy Spirit, like a wind, blows through a community, and God begins to work in a really supernatural way in people's lives. Sometimes it's in a family. It's, it's just there's no explanation other than the wind has blown on a family, and they just come to the Lord like snow off a ditch. They just begin to come to the Lord. I was in a mission last year. <clears throat> David Legg and I were, were conducting it outside Banbridge. And I think it was the closing night. There was a man came out and as he came out, he had listened to the gospel. Now, there was, was great prayer. The people had been really seeking the Lord. There was a lovely sense of God in the meetings, and God had been working. But the closing night, this man went out, and honestly, as he shook hands with me at the door, I really thought, do you even know where you are? He looked, he looked like a rabbit with headlights on it. You know when you see a rabbit and it just glares at you? Just, that's what he looked like going out. I thought, I mean, you, you're really stunned looking. What I didn't realize was that the Lord was so dealing with that man that night. He had no Christian background. On the way home, his family talked to him. He never answered them. Never answered them. When he got home, as a godless man, when he got home, he went in through the house upstairs, and he found a Bible. And this grown man fell on his bed, and he cried and cried and cried to God that God would have mercy on him. 
He didn't know the words to say that I need to be saved. He didn't know that. But what he did know was that God, the Holy Spirit, God was speaking to him. And what an amazing conversion. What an amazing conversion. He, he got onto the phone and he rang his father, who was a godless man. He rang his relatives. He didn't even know to say to them, I've got saved. He didn't know. He just said, God has met with me. You see, my dear friends, when the Holy Spirit strives with a person, then choices are offered. God says, my spirit shall not always strive with man. God draws near and he speaks. I remember my wife, when she was missioning for the faith mission many years ago, telling the story her and another pilgrim were conducting a mission. And there was this particular man who had come along and the, the, all the Christians were praying for him to get converted. And they came night after, and she said every night he came. And they knew that God was speaking to him. They knew that God was speaking to him. And she said one night in the meeting as they preached and one led, and one, she said the tears, you could see them running down his face. Running down his face. She said the next night he came in, he was like a rock, cold and hard, sitting. And she said he had no interest, none. Something happened in that 24-hour space. Something happened there. A few weeks later, after the mission, he was in the local health center in to get medication, and as he walked to the counter, he dropped dead. God says, my spirit shall not always strive with man. Listen, dear friend, you don't have a hold on your life. God does. People so rashly say now, oh, I'm doing this tomorrow. Oh, this is my plans. Oh, this is what I'm doing. <laughs> Are you? Did you not consider maybe that the Almighty might have other things? Do you ever say, God willing, I'll do that? The sign of conviction. My dear friends, God brings a sense of need, unworthiness. But there's contrition. Means a sorrow for sin. A sorrow for sin. I'm sorry. Coming to God and acknowledging where you are. Now, some people say to me, well, I've heard, especially Roman Catholic, dear Roman Catholic people, and they'll come and say, I confess my sins to God. Well, let me tell you, dear friend, God doesn't want you to confess all your sins to him to get saved. Do you know why? Because you might miss one out. And if you missed one out, then you'd be lost. Isn't that right? I mean, you'd need to be very clear about confessing them all. God never asked an unsaved man or woman to confess all their sins to him. No, no. What God asks, in fact, what God demands, is that you confess that you are a sinner. That's what God requests. I'm a lost sinner. I'm without God and I'm without hope. I'm on a tightrope that's called life, and at any moment that tightrope could break, and I would be in hell before ever the undertaker got near me or the doctor went for a pulse. I'd be in hell for eternity. You see, my dear friends, if you want to be a Christian, you've got to be sorry for your sin. The Bible says, He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh shall have mercy. There's mercy, absolutely. The Lord longs to forgive you, but you must say goodbye to sin. You must be willing to say, Lord, I, I hate the sin in my life. I hate what I've committed, and I'm turning from it. You might say, well, listen, preacher, I would love to do that, but I'll tell you what my problem is. I'm hooked on sin. My lifestyle, my secrets, what goes on in my mind and in my heart is so dark. How could that ever, how could I ever change? Well, the answer is you couldn't change. You couldn't change. 
But that's why Jesus has to come into your life, because when he comes in, he brings his power into your life, and that changes you. He changes you when you come to him. Jesus said, as many as received him, that is Jesus, as many as received him, to them give he power to become the sons of God. There must be contrition. There must be confession. The Bible says if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you know, I, I often think of my own conversion whenever I sat in that tent, and I think there was maybe a thousand or thereabouts in the tent at that time, and the Holy Spirit, I just knew that God was speaking to me. I knew as though there was nobody else there. I knew that night God was speaking to me. I didn't need anybody to tell me. I didn't need any preacher. I didn't need anybody. I knew God was speaking to me. And you know when God's speaking to you. You know it. And you know when God's putting the heat on you. And you know when your sin's being exposed and your conscience is being stirred. You know. You see, my dear friends, I can remember that so well. And as the preacher gave the gospel appeal, night after night, oh, how I wanted to be saved. But I had so many fears, so many questions, so many concerns, so many doubts. But the desire to be saved got stronger than the desire not to be. The desire to have forgiveness became so strong, I would have been very willing to give a left arm or a right arm to get salvation. I got pretty desperate. And you know what the Bible says? Ye shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. If you come in a half-baked way to God, don't, don't be surprised if you get a whole, an old half-baked thing that they call salvation, but it doesn't change your life and it'll certainly not get you to heaven. Because my Bible tells me if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things pass away. All things potentially, eventually become new. There must be confession. I wonder, have you ever got before the Lord and confessed that you're a sinner in his sight? I wonder, have you ever sensed the pullings of the Holy Spirit as the Lord draws near to you and he speaks into your heart? As he spoke to you whenever there was a death in the family. He spoke to you when that loved one was being carried out. As he spoke to you whenever in the stillness of the night when you looked into the sky and all creation cried at you, there is a creator and you're going to meet him someday and you need to be right with him. I wonder, dear friend, have you ever taken the time to consider that you're dependent on the God of heaven who holds your breath you say, ah, preacher, I'm not planning to die. No, none of us are. You say, I'm not old. You don't need to be old. We're all the right age to die, every one of us. My dear friends, whenever there's conviction, contrition, and confession, it leads to conversion. Conversion. The work of the Holy Spirit in drawing a man or woman to a sense of need, to awareness of their need of salvation. I remember many years ago having a mission uh, up in County Antrim, and when the meetings were over, there was one particular young man, and he came, and he was, oh, he was, he was like thunder in the pew. And I was glad there was a pulpit between me and him, because he, he didn't like me, and I knew he didn't like me. And he didn't like what I was saying, and I didn't mind that, for there was a pulpit in between us, so we were safe enough. And I decided, well, what I'll do is I'll lob every grenade I have at him because I'm in the pulpit and he's in the pew. And so every text of Scripture that I felt would give him a good rap, I threw every grenade I had at him, and he got uncomfortable. And then I started to see his head. He was a skinhead. I started to see the, this semi-bald head coming up. And I knew that the grenades were doing the job. And that evening, he went out of the meeting, and he didn't look at me. He barely shook hands, but he didn't look. And I knew that the Lord was speaking to him knew the Lord was speaking. And one of the other nights following that, he came in. 
Oh, he was a tough fellow, I can tell you. He was a hard nut. But he came in, and at the end of the meeting, there was an appeal made, and who came out with tears rolling down his face into the back room, only Tom. And when he threw his arms around me in the back room, you know, then I thought he was going to tell me he had killed half a Balamina. I never saw a man in such a state. I said, what's the problem, Tom? He said, it's my sin. It's my sin. Mm. He came to Christ that night, and you know he's in full-time work preaching the gospel in Scotland and Ireland. You see, he repented of his sin, and he received the Lord. He was converted. He said, well, what have I to do to be converted? Well, my dear friends, you've got to call on the name of the Lord. You got a call on him. That night I was converted, I remember well. The evangelist had asked me to cut my arm off. I think I would have done it. But he said, you don't have to do that because it's all done. You say, well, how, do, how does the God of heaven who loves us and hates our sin, how can he forgive us? How can he manage to overlook our sin and just by simply asking him to save us, he does it. How can he do that? That doesn't seem right. Oh, it's absolutely right. You see, what God the Father did in his mercy, because he's a righteous and a holy God and hates sin, God had to punish sin. He couldn't overlook it, had to be punished. And so I was a victim of sin and I was vulnerable. So, I mean, the right thing for me was I should have been condemned and sent to hell. That's what I deserve. I'm very conscious of that. That's what I deserve and that's what you deserve. Because we have rebelled against him. We have broken his laws. But God is a God of love. And what God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit decided to do was that the Father would punish the Son for you and me. That was the plan. And so, my dear friends, I, when I come to death, I'm going to heaven. I know I'll be in heaven someday. I'm looking forward to it. I was listening to these men singing earlier on, I was thinking, you know, a lot of people say in heaven, the, the singing, I've heard people having out-of-body experiences, and they say, oh, is this thing about the singing. It's going to be wonderful, heaven. It's going to be wonderful. And if you have a loved one there, don't be, I mean, I know it's easy to say, but, but listen, if they're there, they wouldn't come back. They wouldn't come back. It's a wonderful place, heaven. And I'm going there. You say, well, how are you going? I'm going because of Jesus. That's just Jesus. You say, are you going because you, I mean, you preach and you go out? No, I'm not depending on any of that. I just do that because I love Jesus. I'm not doing that to get to heaven. I, I'm already going. God punished Jesus for our sin. Many years ago in the Civil War in America, there was a family, few families, they had got caught up in the Confederate Army. And the Union Army had caught these number of Confederate troops, lined them up for execution. A young man who knew one of these families, he saw the father of a household, and this young guy was single, not married obviously. <laughs> And he looked on and he watched the Union Army as they lined these men up for execution. He ran over to the captain and he said, excuse me, sir, yes. He said, uh, are you going to execute those men? Yes, he said, they're, they're enemy, Confederate soldiers, they're going to be shot. He said, that man there, that man has a wife and a family, he's a lot of us, I mean his family, he said he shouldn't have joined the army. The young guy said, well, <clears throat> If I went into his place, if I, if I went over and stood in his place, would you let him go? He said, what? He said, if I walked over and stood where he's standing, would you let him go? He said, yes, I would, because somebody has to pay for the crime. You would merely be taking his crime as a Confederate soldier. And he did it. 
The young man walked over and he forced this man with wife and family to go to the side and to return home. And, and the firing squad shot and they all died. And in Missouri, to this very day, Missouri, America, you can go and there's a headstone in a cemetery and it says these words, sacred to the memory of Willie Lear, he took my place. On the cross of Calvary, Jesus took your place and you can be free, but you must come to him. You must come to him. Dear friend, if the Holy Spirit is striving with you, you'll know it. God's working in your heart, you'll know it. All I'd say to you now as I close is this. Do not delay. Do not ignore. Do not neglect. Because your soul will live as long as God lives. And your soul, Jesus said, can be lost. Now you'll not lose your soul, will you? You'll not do that. Don't lose your soul. Let's bow and pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you that you have provided salvation freely for us in the person of Jesus. We ask tonight that the Holy Spirit will speak to people and that, Lord, there will be those tonight who will seek you with all their heart and will find forgiveness, salvation, and a home in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.